Thanks, guys. I love the line in that song, Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. I love it. Um, And I'm excited because I get to read one of your psalms this morning. Um, I won't tell you who wrote it, but I get to read it, so that's pretty cool. Um, If I can get it out without knocking over the whole podium. So this is from one of you. Um, It doesn't have a title, just a psalm. It says, you are love, you are good, you are everywhere. You live within each of us, all of us. You live within me with the ability to see, feel, experience, share, and accept good and love, you are right here. It is simple. With every effort to explain, defend, define, clarify, and classify, we complicate you. Yet you make it simple, as easy as breathing the air. I see, feel, experience, accept, and share you. You live within me. You are love. You are good. You are everywhere. It is simple. You are my God. Isn't that beautiful? So thank you to whoever of you wrote that. Um, It's a great one. And I only have one of those to share with you today. I know sometimes we've done two, but I do have one from the Bible to read for you too. (laughs) So if you have a Bible with you or can reach, I know there are some scattered around. Um, We're looking this morning at Psalm 46. I'll give you a second to turn to it if you're one that likes to follow along. Psalm 46. It says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river who makes glad, whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he's brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for these words from Psalm 46. We thank you for the comfort and the challenge that they offer us, and we ask that you will speak to us this morning and let your spirit work in us so that we can leave this place at least a little different than the way we came in. In your name we pray, amen. So I think this is my absolute favorite psalm. So when John and Jeremy and I decided to do a sermon series this summer on the psalms, I kind of jumped on this one as fast as I could. (laughs) I remember reading it for the first time when I was in high school. Um, And my mom was preparing for a biopsy on a lump that they had found in her breast. And thankfully, it turned out to be nothing. And my mom is very healthy to this day. But it was a scary month or so as we were preparing for the worst in our family. And I've, I've come back to this psalm over and over in difficult times like that. So it means a lot to me. God is our refuge and our strength, our very present help in time of trouble. It's one of those psalms that I think can give us lots of comfort in difficult times, but the thing is, to get to the comfort in this psalm, you have to go through a whole lot of fear first. There's some really kind of scary images in this psalm. If you were to put them on a screen, there was an image, I think, as I was reading, um, and it looks almost more like a Game of Thrones scene than something comforting. That doesn't look like much fun, (laughs) but you have to get through that fear to get to the comfort. There's kind of a give and take in this psalm. There's these scary images like this, but then all of a sudden the psalmist will switch gears and interject a moment of peace in the middle of a storm. Let me show you what I mean. The psalm starts with taking apart the very foundations of the earth. It talks about mountains falling into the sea. It talks about the earth quaking and the oceans roaring and foaming. These are scary kind of earthquake-like images. 
When we think of mountains and oceans, we think of something that's very permanent and very stable. If you were to look out a window on a sunnier day than today and see the Olympics or the Cascades or even Mount Rainier, if you can forget that it's an active volcano, then you, you see things that are very stable and permanent and we don't think of them going anywhere. But here in this psalm, they're shaking and they're falling into the heart of the ocean. But this is more than just a scary image of an earthquake. See, in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament, the ocean was a really important symbol. The sea was an important symbol. And it, it was kind of a metaphor for everything that's chaos in our lives. The sea was unpredictable and huge. You couldn't see the end of it. And there are creatures that live underneath it that you can't see, and there are storms that you can't predict. It was this huge, chaotic force in the lives of the people of the Bible. If you think about it, it makes sense, right? For us, we have airplanes. We can just fly over the ocean like it's no big deal. We have cruise ships or container ships or these huge vessels that are meant to kind of take on the ocean. So for us, the ocean is kind of one of those things we can conquer, right? We can travel on it. We can use it for trade. But for the people at the time of the Bible, it was this terrifying, chaotic thing. So when this psalm was written, it was talking about mountains falling into the heart of the sea. So everything that's stable and permanent, everything that we thought was powerful, is being overtaken by chaos. It's this really deep, kind of terrifying picture of everything that we hold dear falling into chaos. But then, all of a sudden, the psalmist interjects a moment of peace. The psalmist writes, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. See, a river is another one of these symbols that's kind of the opposite of the sea, of the ocean. The river was something that gave life. The river was a place where you could fish and get food for your family or something you could put your little boat on and travel to another town to trade. It was where you could get water because the water was moving and not stagnant. A river was life. So when the psalmist says that there's a river in the city of God, he's saying where God is, there is life. In the midst of the chaos, God brings us life. Where God is, there is life. God, our ever-present help in time of trouble, is with us, bringing us life, bringing us peace, bringing us out of the chaos and making us glad. Even the psalmist says, when the chaos reigns, God brings life to our souls. Where God is, there is life. And then the psalmist goes on, taking apart kind of the foundations of our earthly power structures. It talks about kingdoms falling and nations being destroyed. And then again, the psalmist interjects with peace. He says, God is with us. God is our fortress. In other words, these powers that we've set up, these governments or kingdoms, or maybe kind of the metaphorical kingdoms and nations we set up in our relationships or in our workplaces, these things aren't where we find our safety. They're temporary. They can fall. God is our fortress. God is the safe place. When it seems like all the places we thought were safe fall down. So there's this give and take in this psalm. There's chaos and then there's life. There's, there's unsafety with all of our power and structures falling and then there's safety in God. And then in verse 10, God speaks and he has the audacity to say, be still. In the midst of all of this, God says to us, his people, be still and know that I am God. Amidst all the chaos and fear and change, be still. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I am not one of those people who finds it easy to be still when things are stressful or changing or chaotic around me. I want to do something. When I get stressed, I have to find something to do. I remember when I was in seminary and exam week would roll around, our apartment would get cleaner than it had been all year because I just had to do something. Mom and dad, if you're watching, of course I would study, of course. <laughs> but I also had to see something with tangible results so I would clean and it helped me deal with the stress. If Jeremy and I are traveling and something goes wrong, I can't just sit back and let the experts handle it. I have to do something, I have to help. <laughs> because if there's a way that I can help, if there's something I can do, then I have control, right? then I am in control of the chaos and I can figure it out on my own. That's how I am when stress comes. But God says in those moments, no, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the heavens and I will be exalted in the earth. Be still. I've heard lots of sermons and read devotionals and those kinds of things about this passage and often this command to be still gets talked about as a command for personal devotion. <laughs> to find some time to, to get out of the busyness of life and be still before God, be quiet. Maybe find a place in your house or at a park or with a great view somewhere and be still before God. So before I go any further, first of all, let me say I am pro personal devotions. Please find time in your schedules to, to do personal devotions. It's a great way to rejuvenate and reconnect with God, but I don't think that's what this is about. I think it's something deeper than just finding time to be quiet on our own. I think God's call to be still is a call to give up control, a call to yield to him, to recognize who really is our fortress. You see, we live in a world that's broken, where things aren't as they should be. We live in a world where sometimes it feels like the very foundations of the earth are falling into chaos, but God is the one who brings life. We live in a world where we think that we are the powerful ones, where we have the ability to control the chaos, where if we just find something to do, then it will all be okay. But God says, no, he is our fortress. He is our safe place when things start to go wrong. God says, be still in these moments. Our world, both literally and figuratively, is capable of falling apart. It's temporary. These symbols of power and of permanence and stability are temporary. They're not as strong as, they, as we think that they are. We are probably not as strong as we think we are. And that's when God calls us to be still. So he can bring us life in the chaos and safety in the war. Not just be quiet, not just find a softly lit corner of your living room and read the Bible for a while, but really, in the depths of your soul, be still. I'm, I'm kind of a nerd, so I went back to the Hebrew to look at this psalm to see, kind of, to try to get to kind of the heart of what this command to be still was all about. And I saw lots of different translations. One was yield, kind of give yourself over to God. One that I really liked was stop fighting. Stop fighting and know that I am God. The brashest one that I read was shut up. <laughs> <laughs> that actually was one of the, so there was a prominent scholar who said it should read, shut up and know that I am God. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but they all get to this idea, right, of giving over our control. Stop fighting, yield, shut up, know who is really God in this situation. Know who brings life and safety. Many of you already know the story of Exodus, right? When Moses leads the people of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery. But what you probably have never noticed, I never did, um, is there's a moment in the story where God tells Israel to be still. 
So if you know the story, Israel was escaping from Egypt. There were these 10 plagues, and it destroyed Egypt's crops and water supply and even their families. And finally, Pharaoh says, okay, you can go. So Moses leads them out into the desert. But then Pharaoh goes, wait a second, I just gave away all of my slaves. What are we supposed to do now? So he wants them back. So he sends his army after them into the desert. And there's this moment where Israel is trapped between the Red Sea chaos, right? And the, the army of their enemies coming after them. And listen to what happens. I'll read the story from Exodus. This is in Exodus 14, verse 10, if you're following along. It says, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert? What have you done to us by bringing us here? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see behind you today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. God's deliverance was coming. They didn't know how or what it would look like, but it was coming. And if you know the story, then you know that God told Moses to put his staff in the sea, and it split apart so that there were walls of water and dry land that they could walk across. And as soon as the Israelites got to safety on the other side, the walls crashed down on Pharaoh, and they were safe. God's deliverance came. But you can hear in this passage the Israelites longing to take back control. In Egypt, they knew what to do. They had control a little bit over their lives in Egypt because it was familiar and it was safe. They, they wanted to get out of the chaos that was in front of them. So what do they do? They complain, because at least complaining is doing something, <laughs> or at least trying to get someone else to do something. So they could feel like they had some kind of control. But God says, no. My deliverance is coming. All you have to do is be still. Yield to me. Stop fighting. Shut up if we can go that far. <laughs> I'm coming. I am your refuge and strength, God says. We want so badly to be in control. We don't like chaos. Of course we don't. We don't like the feeling of our mountains falling into the sea and of our kingdoms and nations and seats of power that we've set up in our lives and our relationships and our workplaces being taken down. But it's in those moments that God gives us life and that he can be our safe place, our refuge, our fortress. God calls us to stop fighting we work so hard to find something that maybe we can do so we can help the situation along. But God says, stop fighting. Be still. When all of these things fall, all these mountains and kingdoms and powers and things in our lives we think are so permanent and stable, when those things fall, and they probably will, that's when we hear the words of Psalm 46. The assurance that there is a river that makes glad the city of God, that where God is, there's life. And our deliverance is coming. We might not know when or how or what it might look like, but it's coming. All we have to do is be still. Yield to God. Give up control. Let God bring his deliverance. Let God bring his life and his safety to us. Be still and know that he is God. He will be exalted among the nations. He will be exalted in the earth. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the one who is worthy to be praised. And we thank you that you are our safety and our fortress and our strength and our giver of life. Lord, we ask that we would all take to heart these words from the psalm, even if they might be difficult at times, and to look for you, to be still and wait for your deliverance because we know it's coming. 
In your name we pray. Amen.